2. The Morality of Pornography The U.S. Supreme Court, in dealing with the subject of pornography, has, with its usual legal refinements, strained at gnats and swallowed camels. A literary work, no matter how perverted the sexual theme, nor how gross the violence, is not pornography if it is socially significant. Social significance thus gives a redeeming quality. Local communities can now determine matters for themselves and establish social significance. This viewpoint is not surprising. The modern writer too often sees himself as an artistic political tractarian or a sociologist with prophetic insight. In short, as the modern successor to the prophets of Israel and to the priests and pastors of Christendom, the artist is the new voice of inspiration in our humanistic culture. If the artist is faithful to his calling, his is a prophetic vision with socially redeeming value. The question, of course, is what has social significance and is thereby characterized by redeeming qualities? In one sense, everything has social significance, including murder and rape. In another sense, none of the contested modern works is socially significant or redeeming from the perspective of historic Orthodox Christianity. However, all are socially and religiously significant from the standpoint of modern humanism. Clearly, two different worldviews and religious perspectives are at war here. Much of the confusion results from the mixed motives of participants on either side. For example, too many of the opponents of pornography are simply traditionalists, not Christians. Their perspective is not theological, but merely an unwillingness to see too great a change take place in society. They defend morality, not by being moral, but by opposing immorality, which is not Christianity, but Phariseeism. For this reason, the Victorian era was strongly anti-Christian, highly immoral, and yet much given to championing morality as an antidote to social upheavals. It welcomed Darwin gladly, because Darwin gave the Victorians reason to take Christianity merely as a stabilizing agency, rather than as a living faith, which was their purpose all along. Earlier, the evangelical movements had revitalized Britain, and for this she was now ready to give thanks, but not allegiance to that faith. Kenneth Clark has observed the non-Christian and, we would say, anti-Christian nature of 19th century prudery. Speaking of Britain, he notes, quote, That fear of the body, which is usually called Victorian, is a subject worthy of a more disinterested examination than it has yet received. Unlike the scruples of the early Christians, it had no religious motive and was not connected with a cult of chastity. Rather, it seems to have been a necessary part of the enormous facade behind which the social revolution of the 19th century could adjust itself. The unwritten code of physical respectability that was then produced seems at first to be full of inconsistencies, but analysis proves it to have had one overriding aim, to avoid the coarseness of truth. Thus, it was possible to fill a conservatory with nude figures in Carrara marble, although the mention of an ankle was held to be a gross indecency. End quote. Victorian reality was very different from the facade. The era began, after all, with nude bathing, and then went to the other extreme, not out of modesty, but to titillate. The hoop skirts were so designed that on stairways and when the wearer was bending over, maximum exposure would prevail. Victorian morality was pragmatic, concerned more with social effects than with pleasing God. Many of the contemporary champions of decency in literature, television and public life are not unlike the Victorians. When a friend of mine, Raymond Wagoner, met with a national organisation designed to combat pornography, he found it definitely disinterested in taking a specifically religious and biblically moral stand in the matter. It was one thing to invoke the name of God as a resource, another thing to take a theologically consistent position. Great sums had been raised nationally to combat pornography, 
but the position of the organisation was essentially that it favoured decency because indecency is socially disturbing and has a bad influence on youth. This is pure pragmatism. If someone should be helped by a pornographic book or aided socially and economically by an act of adultery, would this organisation then favour pornography and adultery? The intellectual and religious bankruptcy of such a position is all too obvious. However, most of the liberal defences of pornography are equally muddled. Writers and university professors feel quite heroic in taking the witness stand to avoid that some outrageously immoral book is somehow supremely moral. These men usually display two contradictory motives. First, they oppose the censorship of any book on any grounds as a matter of principle. Anything and everything should be freely published. Some would impose restraints on things that are Nazi, racist or similarly tabooed, but many are earnest champions of unlimited freedoms of publication. Unlimited freedom is for them a supreme good. Second, since unlimited freedom is seen as a supreme good, it follows that the results of such an unlimited freedom must somehow be good. They therefore feel it necessary to defend the moral integrity of such books as are attacked for their use of this license. As a result, these scholars and writers place themselves in a most amusing position. They are ready to defend anything attacked on moral grounds, as though freedom makes all its adherents good. No doubt if some avant-garde writer issued a book empty of everything save a cake of cow dung between its covers, scholars would not be lacking to interpret for a court what a profound and redeeming social commentary was at stake. This schizophrenia is due to the fact that, having dropped Christian morality in favour of a humanistic code, these men are still trying to justify themselves in various literary works in terms of the faith of their fathers. They are, in effect, offering incense at two altars, and the result is confusion. Let us briefly glance at one trial and its testimony, the London trial of the publishers of Last Exit to Brooklyn by the American writer Hubert Selby Jr. Almost all of one day of the ten-day trial was devoted to the testimony of Frank Kermode, Lord Northcliffe, Professor of Modern English Literature at the University of London. Kermode testified that he was greatly moved by the book and by its originality and moral power. What did he mean by moral power? Kermode answered, quote, It seems to me that one of the purposes of serious novelists has always been to deal with what some of the earliest proposers of realism called contemporary moral reality, and it seems to me that this book does therefore stand with all its differences of manner and language, in a tradition which is a very honourable one, the tradition which uses novels not as forms of entertainment so much as ways of examining, not for propaganda purposes, but simply examining and laying before the reader a picture of contemporary moral reality. I thought that this book, dealing as it does with the lower depths of a great city, was very much in the tradition of Dickens, who spoke of the shame, misery and desertion of a great capital. End quote. Further testimony by Kermode made it clear, however, that this examination by Selby was more than clinical. In fact, he attributed to Selby, quote, great integrity of purpose and, above all, a passion and sympathy for those deprived and depraved people which communicates itself very strongly to the reader. End quote. Selby is thus doing more than examining homosexuals. He views them, Como tells us, with passion and sympathy. The prosecutor then asks Kermode, quote, whether the feelings of homosexuals under the influence of huge doses of benzodrine are not described as pleasurable, end quote. Kermode answered, quote, I think you must distinguish between a passage which says that homosexuals are sometimes happy and a passage which says, come and be a homosexual. There seems to me to be no implication here whatsoever that this is a good idea. End quote. We are not interested in arguing any point with respect to Selby's book, but what would Kermode do if an author stepped forward after Kermode's defence to avow that he was a homosexual 
and as an artist was pleading the homosexuals' cause and inviting others to share in their experience. The sad fact is that while some authors have been very candid in their books, the scholars, and sometimes clergymen, who are defending them are determined to find a higher and purer cause in their writings. Like the Victorians, morality, moral purpose and social significance are used as a facade to provide justification for an alien reality. Sometimes the results are amusing. Ralph Ginsburg has pointed out that many critics and scholars made foolish statements with regard to D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover because of either a desire to moralise or, quote, simply not understanding the book, perhaps the most humiliating fault of all for professionals, end quote. At the New York trial, Ginsburg reports critic Albert Kazin testified that, quote, I have often thought of that beautiful phrase used by John Keats, quote, the holiness of the heart's affections, end quote, because I can't think of any phrase which more perfectly more accurately characterises Lawrence's work as a novelist. Lawrence is the great last figure in English literature, a genius with intense nobility of purpose. He was utterly innocent in the artistic sense. As Lawrence thought, the only place where men and women can still know the greatest spiritual idealism was in love and relationships. Lady Chatterley's Lover, in that sense, is an entirely religious novel. End quote. After a pious testimonial like that, the only thing lacking is a revival meeting altar call. Malcolm Cowley at the same trial sounded an equally pious note. I do not find anything in Lady Chatterley's Lover that essentially I can't find in Lady's Home Journal. In substance, it is what marriage counsellors are telling the counsellees five days a week. This sort of fulfilment in the marriage state has become enormously common. After such gush as this, the irreverent Ginsburg, a master at the art of losing friends and offending people, points out and documents from the book a very salient fact. Quote, Lawrence's central point, end quote, quote, What Lawrence is saying quite plainly is that the highest expression of love between a man and a woman is what British law discreetly calls penetratio per annum. Translated into good plain English, Lawrence is endorsing buggery. End quote. Mixed motives have led those men into a kind of moralizing which is unrelated to their position or in contradiction to it. Not so with Kenneth Tynan, one of the organizers of O oh, Calcutta and former literary manager of the British National Theatre. According to Tynan, when quote, a fearless libertarian has come forth to do battle with the forces of reaction, end quote, his implicit argument is that he hates censorship in all its forms, but does not like pornography. He does not approve of pornography unless he can call it, quote, erotic writing, end quote, and classify it as, quote, unquote, literature. Moreover, as a good liberal with principles, he would not go to court to defend a book, quote, unless it had educational, artistic, or psychiatric value to make it respectable, end quote. In addition, the liberal implies, quote, I read it only in the line of duty and feel nothing but pity for those who read it for pleasure. Needless to say, I never masturbate, end quote. Tynan defends pornography simply because it gives him and others sexual pleasure. He finds his, quote, nutshell case for pornography as art, end quote, and Lionel Trilling's comments, quote, I see no reason in morality or in aesthetic theory why literature should not have as one of its intentions the arousing of thoughts of lust. It is one of the effects, perhaps, one of the functions of literature to arouse desire, and I can discover no ground for saying that sexual pleasure should not be among the objects of desire which literature pretends to us, along with heroism, virtue, peace, death, food, wisdom, God, etc., end quote. This is still a moral justification of sorts, although obviously not a Christian one. The justification for pornography in Tynan is a simple one. Quote, to induce an erection, and the more skillfully the better. End quote. Tynan concludes with a forthright humanistic justification of pornography. Quote, one inalienable right binds all mankind together, 
the right of self-abuse. That, and not the abuse of others, is what distinguishes the true lover of pornography. We should encourage him to seek his literary pleasure as and where he finds it. To deny him that privilege is to invade the deepest privacy of all. End quote. An American scholar gives us a humanistic critique of pornography that created great controversy when first published in Encounter. George Steiner calls attention to the intensely conventionalized quote, dream trash, end quote, of pornography. He is not arguing for censorship, but opposing the actual scholarly defense of pornography as unwise. Commenting later on his attack on four-letter words or night words as pornography, Steiner said, quote, What I was trying to get into focus is the notion of the stripping naked of language, of the removal from private, intensely privileged or adventurous use of the erotic vocabulary. It does seem to me that we have scarcely begun to understand the impoverishment of our imaginings, the erosion into generalized banality of our resources of individual erotic representation and expression. This erosion is very directly a part of the general reduction of privacy and individual style in a mass consumer civilization, where everything can be said with a shout, less and less can be said in a low voice. I was also trying to raise the question of what relation there may be between the dehumanization of the individual in pornography and the making naked and anonymous of the individual in the totalitarian state, the concentration camp being the logical epitome of that state. Both pornography and totalitarianism seem to me to set up power relations which must necessarily violate privacy. End quote. But Steiner's idea of dehumanization has Christian overtones unbecoming to a humanist. Those good humanists, the cynics of Greece, insisted that man was only an animal, and moral pretensions were therefore ridiculous. The cynics favoured and practised public copulation and masturbation to help rid man of the false pretensions his religions gave him. A consistent humanistic argument will justify freedom as such, the freedom of man from all laws and controls extraneous to himself. This was the position of the Marquis de Sade. This, too, is the logical and consistent position taken by the major publisher of sexually controversial works, Maurice Girodia. According to Girodia, quote, freedom must be total. To restrict it to literary or artistic expression is not enough. It must govern our lives, our attitudes, our mental outlook. End quote. Here we come to the consistent and logical expression of the liberal and humanistic argument. Girodia began publishing in his home country, France, but largely in English for smuggling by tourists into Britain and America. Quote, it was great fun. The Anglo-Saxon world was being attacked, invaded, infiltrated, outflanked and conquered by this erotic armada. End quote. Girodia, besides making money like the French bourgeoisie he so much despises, has also a humanistic moral purpose. Quote, enough has been said about the influence of the printed word, but never enough about the liberating influence of the printed four-letter word. Those literary orgies, those torrents of systematic bad taste, were quite certainly instrumental in cleaning the air and clearing out a few mental cobwebs. The imbecile belief that sex is sin, that physical pleasure is unclean, that erotic thoughts are immoral, that abstinence is the proper rule which may be broken at rare intervals, but merely for the sake of procreation. All those sick Judeo-Christian ideas were exposed for what they are. I insist that no little boys were ever corrupted by bad books of mine, and I do hope that they enjoyed them to the full and gleaned at least a little knowledge therefrom. Nobody seems to have died of shock. No reader was ever reported killed by a four-letter word. End quote. Girodia offers no evidence that four-letter words have a, quote, liberating influence, end quote. A discussion of the subject would likely prove redundant. If you believe in principle that four-letter words are a liberating influence, then you will inescapably find them so. 
If you believe in principle that their usage is vulgar and demoralizing, you will surely find them so. The real question in both cases is this. Are the presuppositions valid? Our purpose is to uncover some of the presuppositions which underlie the defense of pornography. Again, Gigo Diaz has described not the, quote, Judeo-Christian ideas about sex, but the Neoplatonist, Manichaean, and Catharist ideas about sex, ideas which indeed have infected many Christians and many humanists. In fact, many pornographic books clearly do presuppose that sex is sin, something the Bible gives no ground whatsoever for assuming. Furthermore, Ziodia believes that, quote, no little boys were ever corrupted, end quote, by his, quote, bad books, end quote, or we may assume by any, quote, bad books, end quote. Police are insistent that the reverse is true. Our concern, however, is not with police evidence or Ziodia's belief, but with the presuppositions of those beliefs, and to them we shall return shortly. Quote, Writing DBs, dirty books, was generally considered a useful professional exercise as well as a necessary participation in the common fight against the square world, an act of duty. What the square world exactly was, nobody could have explained with any precision. But the notion was very strong, indeed, and it was not the usual routine of a new generation picking a quarrel with the old. It was a much stronger and deeper protest not a protest against war or hunger or against the bomb, but beyond that, a protest against the mental weakness, the poverty of spirit, and the general lack of genius and generosity of a rich and sclerotic society. The colourful banner of pornography was as good as any other to rally the rebels. The more ludicrous the form of the revolt, the better it was, as the revolt was primarily against ordinary logic and ordinary good taste and restraint and current morals, end quote. It would be interesting to know, since Girodia raises the charge of a lack of generosity against his enemies, how generous a man he has been. Generosity is a virtue that we more expect from others than cultivate in ourselves. But, more important, Girodia's statement is an excellent expression of the feelings of the underground man, not surprisingly, we now have an underground press in all major cities, promoting, among other things, pornography. Girodia very early set the temper for the underground protest. It was a battle designed to make the square world look ludicrous and absurd. For an army to use an atom bomb to kill a mosquito is at the least ridiculous. It is this kind of absurdity that has served to make the square world ridiculous in its battle against the underground people. Giodia lost in France where bureaucratic power is greater and where important battles are fought in obscure channels. In Britain and the United States, the bureaucratic power is less efficient and Giodia has been successful rather than impotent, to date at least. For Ziordia, the victory thus far is only the first battle of a holy war. Quote, Freedom must be total. End quote. Quote, it may be expected then that we will soon move to the next level. Moral censorship was an inheritance from the past, deriving from centuries of domination by the Christian clergy. Now that it is practically over, we may expect literature to be transformed by the advent of freedom not freedom in its negative aspects, but as a means of exploring all the positive aspects of the human mind, which are more or less related to or generated by sex, end quote. A curious view of man now appears, one close to the popular misconceptions concerning Freud's view, namely that, quote, all the positive aspects of the human mind are all more or less related to or generated by sex, end quote. Man, instead of being a creature made in the image of God whose mind is fashioned as an echo of the eternal mind, is now seen, in a sense, as a creature of his genital organs. His mind, at least, is largely a creature of sex. This view of man has the virtue of presenting man as a unity, a perspective which contradicts Hugo Diaz's belief that no little boy is corrupted by reading dirty books. 
A basic question with respect to the nature of man is at stake, specifically the question dealing with the relationship of mind and body, of thought and act. In the Western tradition, the most common view of man has been based on a dialectical philosophy. Reality is seen as two alien elements or substances, contradictory and yet held together in dialectical tension. In the Greek tradition, it was a dialectical of form and matter. In scholasticism, it was nature versus grace. And in the modern world, it is freedom versus nature. The Asiatic alternatives to this dialecticism have been monism, India, and dualism, Zoroastrianism. It is a weakness of the dialectical position that it tends to break down into either dualism or monism. The biblical position is hostile to dialecticism, monism, and dualism. It is theism. Man is a unity, his entire being a creation of God. There is nothing separate or eternal about soul or spirit. There is thus an essential unity of thought and act, because man is of a peace. Quote, For as he, a man, thinketh in his heart, so is he. End quote. Proverbs 23.7 For the most part, the Church has been dialectical in its psychology rather than theistic. As a result, it has greatly weakened its position. Dialecticism, like dualism, is problematic in its explanation of the relationship of mind and body, of thought and act. In monism, since everything is one, the distinction between individual and Brahma is rendered fragile and fatalism is a problem. If mind and body are separate substances, then little boys, and big boys and men, can read dirty books without any consequences, because thought and act are only slightly related. Unfortunately, too many defences of freedom of speech and press are built on this untenable psychology. Where the dialectical tension is resolved into a synthesis, as ostensibly it is in Marxism and National Socialism, then there is no room for freedom. Freedom must be defended, but on tenable grounds. There is a need for developing a concept of freedom in terms of a theistic psychology. Some indications of earlier thinking along those lines appear in a recent study. Giodia, believing that books cannot corrupt, echoes a dialectical psychology with dualistic overtones. But Giodia also sees the mind as a product of, or related to, sex. This fact reflects a very different kind of psychology, one in which man is a unit, is thus regarding man as a unity. Giodia is biblical. However, he is wrong in viewing the mind and its positive aspects as being generated by sex. For although the Bible would not deny the relationship between sex and the mind, neither would it see sex as determinative. The champions of dirty books have usually held a dualistic psychology as Tynan clearly saw. Tynan is ready to agree to the unity of thought and act, provided it gives him an erection. But what if the consequence is something more? What if violence and pornography most assuredly has its share of violence, is the consequence of the thought-act nexus. Law enforcement officers insist that it all too often is. We need not examine their evidence. If, psychologically, there is a strong, though not a necessary or inevitable thought-act nexus, then it is very obvious why there is a police problem, why television violence does have an effect on its viewers, and why, quote, ideas have consequences. Clearly, Tynan's candour flows in very narrow channels. It avoids critical questions. For Giodia, quote, freedom must be total, end quote. He recognises that he was drawn very early, quote, toward a form of individualistic anarchy, end quote. His consistent frankness, incidentally, is to be commended. But can freedom ever be total? None of us can claim the right to steal, kill, lie, or fornicate at will when and where he chooses. The right to shout fire in a crowded theatre is denied to all by society, and with good reason. To publish lies about another person is not a part of our permitted freedom, nor would a social order allowing it be at all welcome. 
The freedom Jiudia enjoys is possible precisely because freedom in our society is not total. Were it total, whatever he might accumulate would be readily and easily expropriated by other men. Jiudia describes petty and ugly tyrannies he suffered at the hands of the French bureaucracy for defying them and proving them wrong. His story has a familiar ring, and there is no reason to doubt it. The tyranny he would experience from total freedom would be far more drastic. Total freedom means total anarchy and total tyranny, the power of every man to do as he pleases and to kill and steal at will. From a biblical perspective, freedom cannot be total, because man is a creature. Only God is totally free. Wherever and whenever man seeks totality in any area of life, he introduces tyranny. Total power or total freedom for church, state, school or man is always tyranny. It means an attempt by man and institutions to play God. Total freedom means total power to exercise one's own will and word. No man or institution is to be trusted with such power. Total freedom is indeed the thesis of the self-conscious and consistent advocates of pornography. However, it is not total freedom that is furthered or can further man's freedom, but civil liberty. Civil liberty, though not derived from the state, is administered by the state in terms of the American Puritan understanding of it. Civil liberty imposes mutual restraints in order to further mutual liberties. These restraints are imposed on the individual and upon all institutions, church, state, school, family, industry, labour and everything else. Civil liberty developed not because of any demand for total freedom, but because the very real limitations were placed on all men and all institutions. Thus, the morality of pornography is hostile to civil liberty, because that morality involves a radical misunderstanding of the nature of freedom. In many respects, there were far fewer legal restraints on a man in 15th century Paris, or in the Paris of Louis XIV, than in Giordia's years in France, but there could be no question that men had less freedom in those earlier eras. Freedom has grown as legal restraints have harnessed men and institutions from endangering one another's God-given immunities. For example, in the last 150 to 200 years, there has been more legislation on freedom of speech and its limitations on pornography, on freedom of press and its limitations, and on other related subjects than in other eras. Freedom and restrictive legislation have gone hand in hand in the Western tradition, because civil liberty means legal restraints on abuse of power and of freedom. It is this integral character of liberty and law that is too seldom understood today by the proponents of pornography. Liberty and law are inescapable. To imagine that liberty can be advanced within an anarchistic framework is to sacrifice the whole of the Western achievement. It is to this important consideration that courts and scholars should address themselves. Too many jurists like Justice Douglas are attracted to the idea of total freedom as are all too many scholars. Not surprisingly, pornography, as the great champion of total freedom, draws their earnest, sometimes embarrassed and confused, but usually passionate, support and defence. <laughs>